Hi, I'm Christina. Uh, for those of you who did not have to hear me earlier, um, I'm a second year PhD student in sociology and social policy with an affiliation in the Office of Population Research. I am standing in for my dear friend and colleague, Katie Donnelly Moran. Um, so I'm going to be reading out their introductions of our panelists tonight. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing this panel on social stratification, institutions, and law with Edna Levid, Dara Gonzalez, and Amanda Baumley. Bom I'm sorry, I'm like getting towards the end of the day too, and I can feel that I'm stuttering over my words. Edna Levid is a professor of gender and women's studies at the University of Arizona. Edna's talk is entitled Abolitionist Visions, Data About Queer and Trans Migrants. In her work, Ethna focuses on the connections among queer lives, racialization processes, state immigration controls, and citizenship. Our next speaker on the panel will be Thara Gonzalez, who is an assistant professor of sociology at Northwestern University. Thara will be giving a talk called Unruly Gender, How INGOs Globalized Transgender. Thara uses qualitative and quantitative methods to study the creation and contestation of social categories, particularly for gender and sexuality. Our final speaker will be Amanda Baumley, a professor of sociology at the University of Houston. Amanda's talk is entitled Queer Demography and the Law, How Law and Policies Shake Shape LGBTQ Outcomes. In her work, Amanda studies the sociology and demography of the law with a particular focus on trans demography and the demography of sexuality. So without further ado, I'll turn over the floor to Ethna Levy. Okay, folks. Well, thank you for still being here at four o'clock. That is a lot of energy, courage, and determination. And so I, so forgive me, me and Tech, we'll see how it goes. Um, I want to really thank Christopher and the Center for inviting me, and I want to thank all the audience, my co-presenters, um, for the conversations. I've really learned so much today. It's been fabulous. I'm not a demographer, so I appreciate the opportunity to share my work. I look forward to people's feedback. Okay, this is the title of my talk, Abolitionist Visions, Data on Queer and Trans Migrants. This is a billboard by a group called From the Sexies, who has been putting up abolitionist billboards around New Mexico. The context for my work beginning in the late 90s, my work was driven, I'm sorry folks, and please forgive me, I was gonna give you my abstract. So you'll know what I'm gonna talk to you about. The word ICE in that refers to immigration and customs enforcement. So drawing on reports by the Trans-Latina Coalition and a letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security, this talk asks how data can play a role, not just in making immigration, refugee, or asylum systems more inclusive or responsive to queer and trans migrants, but contribute to abolishing global northern migration control systems entirely because these systems are a source of harm to queer, trans, and all migrants. A little bit of context, since the late 90s, my work was driven by a kind of basic but very troubling question, which is there was information about queer and increasingly trans folks in communities, migrant folks in communities, but what about queer and trans migrant folks and communities? All the information was framed like migrants were straight and gender normative and queer and gender non-conforming folks were citizens. So how do we talk about queer and trans migrants on their own terms to raise issues of concern? To figure this out required challenging the deep pattern normativity that infuses migration scholarship. But that change did start happening because of political and intellectual changes Gary and others have talked about. And a queer and trans migration scholarship began to emerge that centers queer and trans migrants. In terms of conceptual categories, I put this in for demographers because I thought I was supposed to, so I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Queer and trans migration scholarship draws from queer and trans studies that conceives modern sexualities and genders, not as essential identities, but as axes of power that are inseparable from racial capitalist settler and imperial logics and practices. Queer and trans migration scholarship understands queer and trans in two ways then. 
first not as essential or universal, but as identities or identifications that people may claim or mobilize for very important and world-making reasons, or that may be imposed on people by states, corporations, and others to make them legible, governable, or targetable for various reasons. And second, queer and trans are used as analytic rubrics that may not refer to identities at all, but instead pose critical questions about power, knowledge, who is served and who is not served by dominant systems. And these two meanings of queer and trans as identity categories and analytic rubrics are relevant for thinking about how can we generate data about queer and trans migrants for purposes of making the immigration, refugee, and asylum systems responsive in the short term while contributing to these systems' eventual abolition. That question is in conversation with abolitionist work across various disciplines in which queer and trans studies have been centrally involved. People use the word abolition to mean different things. But in general, abolitionist projects share the idea of systems such as the prison industrial complex and border controls emerge from and will produce racial, settler, colonial, capitalist, and cis heteropatriarchal inequalities at local, national, and global scales. Abolitionist projects are not interested anymore in trying to fix these. They're interested in trying to get rid of them. There isn't a blueprint for how to end them, but groups are focused on trying out possibilities. And the process may include making reforms in the short term, but people differentiate between what they call reformist reforms that keep the system going and non-reformist reforms that don't feed into and even expand the existing system. And that's a little chart. Um, from critical resistance that is obviously unreadable, even if you're standing right in front of it, <laughs> but you can't find it online. <laughs> so I apologize about size. I won't go into that. Okay, there is great interest in understanding the role that data can play in abolitionist projects. Kevin Guyan's book, Queer Data, discusses data has always been entangled in relations of rule, oppression, and violence, but also possibility, and Gary talked about this, making people feel we exist, naming and framing issues, and giving impetus to meaningful changes. As the co-founder of Data for Black Lives stresses, the discussions are not a call to abolish data, but to redirect it toward ends that do not contribute to current systems of power, inequality, and carcerality. So to connect this back to queer and trans migrants, how can data about queer and trans migrants be generated that does not contribute to strengthening the current migration control systems that are founded in histories of violence and global inequality, but instead help us along the path to ending these systems? I'm a concrete person, so I said, well, I won't come up with theoretical. What do we have? What has already been done? What do we know about this? Until the 90s, queer folks were barred from immigrating to the United States. So it was difficult to find information about queer and trans migrants and certainly information by queer and trans migrants because being known as queer to the immigration yeah. service or as trans could disastrously affect your legal status. Since 1990, when LGBT exclusion was repealed, information has grown. The big gap is still in terms of government data and it's really, there's a debate about whether we have to pursue that or the risks related. I wanted to take this opportunity to give huge thanks to Gary and the Williams Institute for their groundbreaking work generating data on queer and trans migrants. In 2013, Gary published the first ever estimate of how many adults in the United States were LGBT migrants. Until that estimate, which was updated in 2021, Efforts to research queer and trans migrants were commonly dismissed and trivialized as focusing on a, quote, tiny, deeply unimportant group who are totally irrelevant to the real issues. 
the estimate by Gary named, acknowledged, quantified, and made real the existence of queer and trans migrants, which opened huge possibilities for further work. And I also want to acknowledge the extraordinary like, report since then on queer and trans migrants that the Williams Institute has just been proliferating everywhere. I'm loving it. <laughs> Work by Christopher, his collaborator, Matthew, Sharita Gruberg, and a couple other people has also really helped to move the field forward. Since time is short, I'm gonna jump ahead to talk about the Trans-Latina Coalition with whom the Williams Institute and how they harness data making to an agenda that's about abolition, including of immigration and asylum systems. According to their website, the Trans Latina Coalition was founded in 2009 by transgender, gender non conforming, and intersex Latina immigrant in LA to address their needs. Their website includes three reports, and they have partnered with the Williams Institute for a fourth report that is not on the website. The reports are unique and precious in documenting the lives of people who are trans, migrant, and Latina, about whom we still have so little information. I'll focus on the first, which, but they all include significant discussion about their approach to data collection, as well as recommendations, not just of what further data is needed, but how it should be collected using a community-based participatory approach, which was discussed in the session before lunch. That's the first report. The report tells us trans Latina immigrants have been rendered invisible and inconsequential because their gender identity, migratory status, race, and language are said to defy the norm. The report suggests that surveying trans Latina immigrants about their lives using PAR methods breaks the cycle of invisibility and forced inconsequentiality by generating demographic data and identifying priority issues. And the coalition wants that information to be used quote, as a foundation for new attitudes, policies, laws, programs, and everyday behaviors that humanize and respect rather than devalue and disregard trans-Latina immigrants in the United States. The PAR process performs not just epistemological, but ontological work too. The report suggests that process constitutes individual trans-Latina immigrant women as subjects rather than objects of their own lives, as people who are loved and valued, as members of a community rather than isolated individuals, and as a community that has a future and is global in scope. And this vital ontological and epistemological work is connected to transforming rather than seeking inclusion into existing systems that devalue and dehumanize trans Latina immigrants, rendering conditions of their life very precarious. The third report discusses strategies for translating data into transforming legislation and policies through processes where trans Latina immigrants are directly involved. It outlines important principles to guide the work, including a commitment to abolition, centering indigenous history and practice, and centering rather than exploiting, quote, our transgender community in the pursuit of policy change. The report also offers caution about the limits of legislative change and policy within the frame of the existing system. They write solutions and li liberation have never come from the state that governs us, but from grassroots leaders and those severely impacted who have critiqued the system. And yet, although policy is not the ultimate path toward our liberation, it is a tool we use to demand our rights as transgender Latina immigrants and using that as a full policy. And the report explicitly discusses the migration system as one of the systems that requires abolition. In the interest of time, I'm going to shift to this letter to DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. This is, of course, 
fabulous Julio Salgado. These are trans queer immigrants who are bigger than the border. So the letter, I wanna talk about a letter that eight organizations sent to the secretary of DHS and the acting director of ICE. The letter makes three demands. One is to immediately release all trans and HIV positive people from immigration detention. Second, create a policy that deems all trans and HIV positive migrants as not detainable. And third, and this really gets at who is shaping the categories, review the system whereby immigration officials decide who counts as trans and HIV positive or not. The letter is queer and trans in both senses I described earlier in terms of addressing both identities and analytics. The organizations that signed the letter include but extend beyond trans and migrant centered organizations. The demands center the work of trans migrants and allies who have been working for years to end rather than reform trans detention. And groups of concern are described as trans and HIV positive migrants who are also in some cases described as gay. And the groups overlap and diverge in ways that highlights the politics of mobilizing people based not on identities, but coalition. The letter frames its demand for abolition by noting ICE has regularly promised to reform its system for detaining trans migrants, but that these reforms have been, quote, a fool's errand. I find it a really astonishing letter to have sent to the secretary. The letter sums up under both Democrats and Republicans, DHS has wasted millions of taxpayer dollars attempting to overcome a simple and inevitable truth. It is not possible for the US government to house trans and HIV positive asylum seekers safely. Every progressive policy, every well meeting protocol, and every specialized facility has failed. This has to stop. <laughs> In support of this conclusion, they include a 12 page single spaced addendum with extensive information about preventable deaths, medical malpractice, sexual assault, solitary confinement, physical assault, and other abuse experienced by detained and trans, trans and HIV positive people. The information has been compiled from numerous reports, including complaints, lawsuits, news stories, and reports by DHS itself. The letter asserts, and I think accurately, that this information is already known to DHS. It's not new information, and yet little has been done to address the concerns. The fact DHS already knows this information raises questions about what we do when data about systemic violence is consistently produced widely available but not acted on. And the letter writer's response is to argue, this dynamic shows the impossibility of reform and the urgency of abolition. Information about queer and trans migrant lives generated from multiple sources has greatly expanded in recent decades, though information from states remains scanty. In terms of queer and trans migrants, data can be used to try to make the existing migration, refugee, and asylum systems more responsive. And I support that in the short term for practical reasons. Long term, however, I believe we need to think boldly and participate in working toward abolition of these systems. Big debates in queer, trans, ethnic, indigenous, and other fields of study make clear the limits of agendas focused on including marginalized folks in mainstream institutions and systems, rather than addressing and dismantling the structural inequalities that gives these systems life in the first place. And we know that when these structural inequalities are not addressed, more privileged and well-resourced LGBTQ folk may gain some foothold, but queer and trans folks with less privilege and fewer resources become more criminalizable 
disposable, excludable, and affordable. And we can see this in terms of the immigration system, where we do have more million dollar queer investors getting green cards for legal residency, and a relative handful of folks whose experiences of persecution can be appropriated for virtual signaling by the state are given asylum. And yet we're not dealing with poor and working class, queer and trans migrants of color who have been forced into migration and find themselves undocumentable, criminalizable, exploitable, detainable, and deportable under the rules of the global northern migration and asylum systems that emerged from and reproduce global inequalities. To tie this together, so that Chris doesn't beat me with a wet nail over the head. <laughs> <laughs> The Trans Latina Coalition offers us a model for thinking how data can be generated by and for marginalized folks who are most likely to be targeted, dispossessed, criminalized, and deported, mm -hmm. and how that data can both identify urgent needs while creating conditions for transforming or abolishing current immigration and asylum systems long term. The data also shows transformation has to include creating conditions for people who have been dehumanized, devalued, and silenced to become the people who define research agendas and become subjects of their own lives. The letter to DHS and ICE shows how data on trans and HIV positive migrants has been mobilized by the government to constantly affirm the promise of reform that props up or even expands the violent system and we need to demand abolition instead. Taken together, these two projects show data can be queered and trans, both in terms of generating by and about people who identify or are seen by others as LGBTQ plus migrants, and in terms of ensuring that the data is not used to reify essential identities or existing system, but to critically question violent social, economic, and political systems that are pushing people to migrate, but leaving them without legal status. And the data can help us build coalitions oriented to transformation and abolition, because we really can do this differently. Thank you. Hey, we are all still here. We're still awake. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. So before I begin, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me here to present some of my research. Thanks especially to Chris Velasco for his work organizing this amazing conference. It's so amazing to be in a space with so many scholars of gender and sexuality and demography. My name is Thara Gonzalez. I'm an assistant professor at Northwestern University. And while I am grateful to be here, I also feel like many others, like a bit of an interloper, I have never been to PAA, but now I'm thinking maybe I should go. Um, <laughs> my research lies at the intersection of global and transnational studies, gender and sexuality, and science, knowledge, and technology studies. And so when Chris invited me here to participate in this conference, <clears throat> I started thinking to myself, you know, like, well, what is queer demography? So there are many ways to think about this. We've heard about many of them today, um, and I'm gonna offer two of the more obvious. So on the one hand, Queer demography could be a description of scholarship that uses demographic methods to study queer and gender variant populations. And on the other hand, it could be a description of scholarship that uses queer methods to study the classification processes on which demo demography relies. <laughs> or like many of the people who spoke today, you could do both. Um, my research really falls into the latter camp. I'm interested in how institutional classifications and the people they describe emerge and transform over time, as well as the social consequences of classification processes. So a lot of my research focuses on how gender and sexuality categories are created, contested, and transformed. And these are some of my ongoing projects. In a lot of my research, I'm interested in understanding how cultural transformations happen, especially at the global level. I'm interested in the cultural and political struggles that shape and reshape global social categories. And in the work that I'm going to share with you today, which is part of my book project, I'm examining how the category of transgender has come to articulate gender variance globally. Um, and so a small story might help illustrate the stakes a little bit. At the 2010 conference convened by Human Rights Watch and two national organizations in Barcelona, this was to be the first international convening of, quote, transgender activists globally. Participants were tasked with producing a manifesto of collective demands. 
The meeting, broke the meeting broke down in chaos, however, with some participants demanding to know why there were so few representatives from the Global South, with others declaring later that they were not transgender, but travesti or hijra or fafafine or some other gender category. And in the end, the Declaration of Barcelona was a winding 45-page document that bore no signatures and was endorsed by almost none of the organization representatives in attendance. In the decades since, however, transgender has become an increasingly visible category around which global rights groups are attempting to make claims. So I'm asking, how is it coming to do this? How is transgender coming to articulate gender variance transnationally? How is it becoming an international human rights category? And what are the costs of illegibility? Which kinds of groups are most likely to be excluded? So drawing from a variety of interview, observation, and archival data, the research, I'm just going to give you a snippet of it today, shows how the category of transgender is coming to represent diverse forms of gender variance globally. Okay, so to put it into perspective, this is what the people who are staffing international non-governmental organizations or INGOs have to deal with. This is a demographic question that I was asked to respond to when I attended a conference in 2018 in New Zealand. This was hosted by the largest LGBT INGO, ILGA. I was offered the following 21 options for gender identity um, and nine for sexual orientation. So for those who can't see, these include agender, female, gender fluid, gender queer, male, I'm not gonna read them all, but there are, trust me, there are 21. <laughs> when I return to the same conference, ooh, ah, in 2022, this looks like a balloon. <laughs> so the choices, <laughs> I know, right? So the choices for sexual orientation hadn't really changed, as you can see, but I was offered 42 options for gender identity. And for now, I'm going to leave aside the issues of placing some of these groups into the gender identity question rather than the sexual orientation question, because this really is a debate, um, you know, sort of which group goes into which category. Instead, I want to highlight that when you're trying to make claims in a space like the United Nations, which is the target of a lot of international activism. It is too challenging, obviously, to list all of these groups. Gender experts needed, they need a single category around which they can make claims. And in fact, increasing opposition within the UN makes it particularly important to have a coherent definition for a globally applicable category. Fighting for something without defining it is difficult. So as you might imagine, Studying putatively global categories is complicated, and my research tackles this by examining specific sites of transnational struggle and the ideas and actors within these spaces. I examine how multiple modes of understanding gender variance are coming to be articulated within the category of transgender. So whereas prior scholars have um, sort of debated how categories emerge in a particular place, travel from one national context to another, or manifest differently in different places, I'm interested in something a little bit different. I want to understand how a single category, which carries its own mode of understanding, its own definition, comes to represent or articulate multiple modes of understanding gender variance within global institutions. So one of my conceptual interventions builds on world culture theory, which emphasizes diffusion in the transnational movement of ideas. So scholars in this tradition have done really important work to respond to the neorealist emphasis on strategic action, and instead world culture theorists draw attention to the normative, the cultural, structural elements of transnational movement. I would argue, however, that this framework focuses too much on the beginning and end points of the process it calls diffusion, and it sort of misses what happens in the middle. In contrast, a conceptualized transnational movement of circulation and drawing on Ian Hacking's metaphor of feedback loops, I show how an idea emerges in one place and transforms as it circulates transnationally. And I pay attention to the post-colonial power relations that structure this process. However, in addition to using post-colonial critique as an analytic framework, I show how it actually becomes an actor in transnational classification processes. More specifically, I'm arguing that post-colonial critique is increasingly taken up as a mode of claims making by the people who staff INGOs. As they attempt to instantiate a global human rights category, international non-governmental organizations begin to explicitly grapple with critiques of universalization in a transnational context. Okay, so here's the argument I make in the broader project. I begin by showing how 
the definition of transgender becomes stabilized in US medical discourse and in some US advocacy organizations. And how it is the same definition that becomes standardized in INGOs in the early 2000s. Next, I show how these attempts to rationalize gender variance globally are not entirely successful because there are modes of understanding gender that diverge from the standardized definition. And I show three modes of feedback through which divergences are expressed. Finally, I show what I call the containment strategies that the people who staff INGOs use to address these divergences and shore up the global relevance of transgender. Okay, a little bit of my research design before I show you, show you some of the findings. My book project draws from data in three key interacting arenas. I've already mentioned some of them. The United Nations, the biomedical field, and large international non-governmental organizations, INGOs. Um, I draw, draw from interviews, um, observation, and archival data. Um, and today I'm primarily showing you data from um, the INGOs. I conceptualize INGOs as what Nicholas Gielhoff refers to as key regulatory actors of globalization on equal footing with financial institutions or international organizations. The INGOs I study were mostly founded in the second half of the 20th century. And these organizations engage in a variety of activities, including training and funding activists from the global south, lobbying the UN, <coughs> organizing and hosting conferences and leadership summits, and publishing reports on the conditions of gender and sexuality issues globally. I conceptualize the staff of these INGOs as gender experts. Catherine Sickink or Sidney Tarot might call them norm entrepreneurs or brokers, whose authority derives from their expertise on gender and sexuality issues. An important part of their work is providing knowledge about and managing definitions of gender and sexuality, including writing reports published by the INGOs that they work for. The vast majority are educated in the US and Europe with degrees in law, human rights, international policy, or gender and sexuality studies. And the location and specialization of these degrees suggests that INGO hone their expertise in human rights in the universities that circulate queer and feminist theory that is developed largely in these same institutions. So English language fluency, together with training in human rights, law, and gender and sexuality, <coughs> enables these gender experts to kind of speak the language of the UN, the WHO, and other supranational governing organizations. Gender experts author expert reports. And in the transnational arena, I would argue, expert reports are highly valued. They're a signal that an issue is getting serious attention, and they can be used to get funding, get resolutions passed, and lobby governments. So as a former high-level UN, high UN official put it to me, this was during an interview, and we were talking about the Free and Equal Campaign, which is the UN's kind of main LGBT advocacy branch. He said, why do I care that Free and Equal is publishing some cute little memes and tiny little videos when we used to produce high quality content that would get an impact? I don't care that there is still a little work that's getting done. It's not at the level that it should be. So you can see that reports are understood as one of the most substantial types of work that can be produced and they provide the most direct information that bureaucrats and others have about what's happening around the world. Um, so in the analysis that I'm gonna um, present from in a minute, I draw from interviews with gender experts and an analysis of these expert reports. All right, so we're gonna start um, with standardization. Um, and I argue that in US medical discourse and some early activist organizing, the meaning of transgender came to be standardized in three parts. We've heard a lot about this throughout the course of the day. It's distinction from sexual orientation, the idea that gender identity is distinct from or perceived as sex body, and the idea that the two might not be quote unquote aligned, right? And the definition is predicated on an assumption of a gender binary. And it was the same three-part definition that became standardized in um, INGO expert reports published in the early 2000s. So I'm gonna give you just one example of this. This is a report on sexuality and gender rights in Cameroon, co-authored by many organizations, primarily Human Rights Watch. And you can see all three parts of this definition. Transgender, which is included as part of a glossary of key terms at the end of the report, is defined as, quote, an umbrella term for people whose gender expression or gender identity differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. And it goes on to say, 
Transgender people may be heterosexual, lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So the clarification at the end of the definition is meant to highlight the distinction between gender and sexuality. However, despite the standardization of this three-part definition in earlier ports, it failed. The definition fails based on divergences that are based on the distinction between sexual orientation and gender identity, the distinction between gender identity and the sex body, and an assumption of the gender binary. Divergences appear through three modes of feedback, through active contestation, through implicit rejection in responses to surveys fielded by gender experts, and through the scholars cited in expert reports. I'm gonna give you just one example of this first kind of um, feedback channel, which is active rejection at conferences. This quote is from a conference that I attended in San Francisco in 2019, and it illuminates divergences based on self-identification. So the room was filled with medical providers and transgender activists, and the lunchtime session was on meaningful healthcare engagement. And the panelist, who is a Pacific Islander activist based in California, said, we have had respectable roles as healers, priests, and protectors. We also had cultural terms that referred to us, not about gender, but about what we did and our contribution to the collective. So here, the primary mode of understanding was not about gender, but rather about the uh, social role and social practices. And in other interviews I did, I heard a similar, um, I really liked um, Hiramori's presentation, the, the sort of like idea that identity is a Western construct, because I definitely heard this from other people that I interviewed. Um, and I have other examples I could give. I'm gonna give you an example of the second kind of feedback as well, which is implicit rejection in surveys and interviews. So this is from a report published in 2009 on gender and sexual minorities in Senegal. And the authors described the people they surveyed their report as follows. None of the men we spoke to used terms such as transgender or transsexual or expressed a desire to be or per be perceived as women. Although many individuals had been attacked or threatened because of their gender expression, because they did not seem masculine enough to their attackers. And then they go on to say, despite the implications of the term um, to a Western ear, transgender and transsexual in the sense in which these identities have been articulated in North America and Western Europe, implying a primary identification with the opposite sex, accompanied by a strong desire to change one's gender identity and physical characteristics, are largely absent among um, MSN populations in Senegal. So as this quote shows, none of the interviewees identify with the term transgender, but also keep in mind two more things. First, the reference to the Western ear and to identities in North America and Western Europe, where gender experts themselves are using postcolonial critique to acknowledge the symbolic violence of universalization. Second, I'd like to call your attention to the reference to gender expression, that they were attacked because of their gender expression. This is important for how gender experts attempt to deal with divergences from the standardized definition of transgender. All right, I'm really quickly. Um, I want to get to the last part of the feedback loop. So as feedback emerges, it becomes increasingly untenable to maintain the initial standardized definition. Gender experts have to deal with divergent modes of understanding. How do they do this? They use four containment strategies. Containment strategies are attempts to deal with dissonance from the standardized definition of transgender. The first two strategies attempt to subsume these divergences within the category itself, while the second two transform the meaning of the category. I'm gonna give you an example of the second kind of, um, the second, which is provincialization, it's closely related to the first. It involves implicit or explicit acts of decentering. So often modes of understanding from outside the United States or Europe are provincialized as local variations, while modes of understanding from the United States and Europe are seen as universally relevant. Other modes of understanding are provincialized by proposing transgender as a universal category and including other categories as variations or aberrations from the norm. We can see provincialization clearly in this quote from a 2006 report from Outright on human rights protections in Asian countries. Umbrella terms are designed to include anyone who shares a specific characteristic, whatever specific term they use to describe themselves. They do not replace local terms from a specific cultural tradition or language, including terms that have existed for a long time. Umbrella terms make systematic human rights issues more visible <laughs> while respecting people's individual choice 
to define themselves. So here, the use of the term local, specific, and cultural, specific is actually used three times in two sentences. All of this implies that the umbrella term is a universal mode of understanding gender variance, while other modes of understanding are non-universal, specific, particular, and always exist in reference to this universal. The inclusion of qualifying statements is another strategy for dealing with multiple modes of understanding gender variance. As trans-led organizations enter the transnational arena, and as post-colonial critique became an increasingly important form of political claims making, gender experts began to explicitly acknowledge the, the, universal, the, uni the limits of universalization. All right, to give you just one example of this, this is from a report published by Transgender Europe in 2015. The authors write, but due to the great variety of concepts and self-definitions used by different communities around the world, we use the two established terms, trans people and gender diverse people, often simultaneously. We are aware of the challenges in using these terms as they orig originated in Western discourses in which binary gender sex concepts are assumed as the norm. So the report acknowledges the challenges of universalization and this acknowledgement qualifies the use of the term transgender. Um, I'm gonna skip this for time. I'm gonna to turn to the last strategy, which is perhaps the most transformative. It involves an expansion and incorporation of practice when the language of identity fails. So staff members that I interviewed tied this shift to gender expression to its ability to more broadly capture gender variance despite diverging self-understanding. So this is from an interview with a staff member in an NGO who said, and transgender, as we understand it from a Western perspective, is also quite binary, right? And maybe it was also rooted in kind of like a medical idea. But there are so many cultures around the world that have their own cultural identities that I guess actually encapsulate a diversity of gender expression. So we use gender expression more. Skipping this, only have two minutes. Um, all right, really quickly, we see again this shift to using gender expression. This is in the most prominent document on gender and sexuality rights globally. This is the Jogja Carta of Principles. So in 2006, you have the principles on sexual orientation and gender identity. By 2016, this expands to principles on sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics. All right, um, I'm gonna skip this summary slide because I'm hoping you remember sort of where we went. Um, and I just wanna conclude with some, uh, with some thoughts. So circling back to queer democracy, I think my project points to the challenges that international human rights experts have in making global claims. If we take seriously the idea that nation states matter for the production of classifications, or in Pierre Bourdieu's words, modes of vision and division, then attempting to create modes of division across many countries is even more challenging. Recent decades have seen, as Michelle Lamott puts it, a new wave of energy and activism that is organized, at least in part, around a search for recognition. And as my research shows, some people are seeking not just to be recognized, but to be recognized in very particular ways. The modes of understanding, the classifications that have emerged to make sense of different sexual and gender practices vary, as do the complex configurations of sexual desire, gender understandings, and the sex body. A sociological approach that takes seriously queer and postcolonial critique <laughs> draws our attention not only to how categories fail, but also how they are made to work once again. And I will conclude by noting that the challenges faced by gender experts are common to others like sociologists, um, including myself, who are involved in categorizing and naming social groups and social processes. This is not just something that demographers deal with. In this talk, I've been using the term gender variance to describe the groups that are increasingly <clears throat> described as transgender. And yet this phrase may also eventually carry a specific definition of being implicated in the same containment processes as transgender, and therefore need to be, in the words of Judith Butler, vanquished by those who are excluded, much like the other gender and sexuality categories that have come before it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here today, Christopher, and to the Office of Population Research. Here we began this summit by considering how our research can shape laws and policies. And I want to kind of flip this um, to focus on considering how law and policy, um, the importance of those for considering um, different demographic outcomes. So as we're engaging in career demography, um, I want to kind of close here with a um, discussion of the implications of our current 
legal and political involvement for the rule. Um, so what we know is that the law undoubtedly is playing a role in many areas of demographic studies in the United States, particularly when it comes to immigration, increasingly when it comes to reproduction, and in a multitude of ways for racial and ethnic minorities. Demographers, although many think of demographers as late to the game, we do have this history of engaging in research that is responsive to social movements and to perceptions of inequality. Uh, they are a source for empirically assessing inequality and for evaluating the effectiveness of laws and interventions. So in many respects, accounting for legal effects is really nothing new for us. As this field of queer demography has emerged over the past couple of decades, however, political and legal factors um, have really played and continue to play a fundamental role. Virtually every inquiry into demographic outcomes for LGBTQ individuals is rather directly shaped by laws and policies to the degree that a consideration of legal factors is almost a given in demographic analyses of these populations. So I'm gonna consider a few of these today. Demographers who are examining employment outcomes, marriage and partnership formation, parenthood, um, health outcomes, migration decisions, we've often had to grapple with the effects of patchy access to legal rights across the United States or with the presence of laws that are overtly discriminatory. In my own work, I've largely focused on employment and parenthood laws, as well as the effects of laws on migration. A lot of the work that's been done in these areas has revealed how the legal context in which LGBTQ individuals are embedded can predict access to protection from discrimination or legal recourse in the face of discrimination. And this was notably seen in early studies of income inequality, with many arguing that this lack of federal protection against employment discrimination prior to 2020 was resulting in worse outcomes for sexual and gender minorities. In my own research in this area, I considered the effects of wages, um, of, on wages of residing in states with employment non-discrimination laws. And what I found is that the presence of these laws reduced some of the income differential between men and same sex and different sex partnerships. Uh, but what is notable, I think, is that the law was shaping income differences for LGBTQ individuals in another way through access to marriage, which differed across these states. The income gap for men between same-sex partners and different sex married partners was far greater than the gap compared to different sex unmarried partners. And in recent analyses of 2019 and 2021 American Community Survey data, I found that this continues to be the case with men who are married to men earning about 8% less than men who are married to women. But there was no statistically significant differences for cohabiting men. So this patchy access to marriage across states prior to 2015, as well as differential returns on marriage for gay men compared to straight man, men, and as Wendy mentioned, um, differences that are due to duration in marriage as well. All these things are an important part of the story of income inequality based on sexual orientation. Um, in some recent work that I've done with Lee Badgett and Steve Boucher, We've been examining data on sexual and gender minority employment discrimination charges. Um, so we have data from the EEOC um, that describes people's experiences with discrimination. And we also saw variation in the issues alleged in charges for those who are residing in states that have non-discrimination laws compared to those without those laws. Uh, so for example, 52% of charges in states without non-discrimination laws included harassment as an issue compared to only 41% of charges in states with um, non-discrimination charges. And we also saw charges in states without a non-discrimination law were more likely to include retaliation um, as a basis compared to those um, with a non-discrimination law. So we're seeing that residing in areas that are less legally and politically friendly to LGBTQ individuals could mean more exposure to harassing type discriminatory experiences. And we would expect that this harassment would then translate into other employment outcomes including being employed full-time or income inequality um, or promotion differences. We also see similar effects of patchy access to rights or exposure to discriminatory laws in the area of parenthood, um, where states differ in terms of access to things like second parent adoption, um, which permits a non-biological parent to adopt a child um, in order to acquire parental rights. In earlier work that Delane and I conducted, we examined how laws like these um, as well as restrictions on adoption or fostering, shapes the presence of children in same-sex households. So drawing on census data, we found no effect of these restrictive parenting laws 
on the presence of children in the households, but we did find that access to rights, like those that are acquired through second parent adoption, did matter as a predictor of parenthood. Through our book project, which involved qualitative interviews with LGBTQ parents, uh, we found that parents often found ways to work around these restrictive laws, such as through foreign shopping um, or not disclosing their sexual orientation when they were in the process of adoption, but that obtaining these more affirmative parenting rights or property-related rights was much more difficult if you lived in states with restrictive laws. And given that only about 49% of LGBTQ adults live in states with access to second parent adoption outside of legal marriage, um, these factors continue to shape parenting experiences. So despite the changes that we've been seeing in terms of legal marriage, as well as the more recent extension of Title VII to cover employment discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, um, this variation in legal and political environments across the U.S. continues to be an important when we're considering demographic outcomes. And this is particularly the case because we're seeing a surge um, in new state-level legislation that's targeting gender and sexual minorities. The number of bills that was introduced in 2023 and already introduced this year is more than two and a half times what we were seeing um, just a couple of years ago. The bills have included things such as restrictive restrictions on gender affirming care for children and adults, um, reporting parents to child protective services for providing gender affirming care, the ability to play school sports teams um, aligned with one's gender identity, limitations on providing education on sexual and gender identity in school, um, and many others. So we've already seen the effects of anti-LGBTQ bills and um, related political attacks, particularly when we look at mental health outcomes. There have been several, several studies that have found that residing in states with these types of policies or exposure to news stories um, about anti-LGBTQ bills and political rhetoric is related to increased depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. And these feelings are exacerbated if LGBTQ individuals perceive individuals in their social network to support negative policies and rhetoric. Alongside these mental health effects from exposure to legal hostility, many of the proposed laws and bills overtly curtail access to rights and services that are needed by LGBTQ individuals, such as gender affirming care. And so given the strong potential for negative consequences, coupled with this patchwork nature of these negative legal and political contexts across the US, both LGBTQ individuals and those with LGBTQ family members could seek to avoid states that are promoting these bills. And so in a recent study co-authored with Audrey Miller and Elizabeth Gregory, I focused on the potential influence of the surge in bills um, and new laws on interstate migration decisions. And in particular, we asked how do state level laws restricting gender and sexuality rights influence attitudes about desirability of migration? We were assessing attitudes, we weren't just assessing actual migration decisions or movements. So in considering uh, this question, I was particularly interested in the ways that state-level bills and laws could affect attitudes about wanting to move to a state. And we know that interstate migration is influenced by individual characteristics as well as characteristics in the state of origin and state of destination. And so if we think of Lee's uh, foundational migration theory, he described these positive and negative factors in both the place of origin and the potential destination. Um, we could talk about push factors that might be economic or cultural um, or environmental that can motivate individuals to leave their places of residence or repel them from moving to a particular state. And pull factors, on the other hand, would be things that are going to motivate individuals to remain where they are or draw them to new locations like job opportunities or crime. And so it's reasonable to expect that restrictive LGBT policies and laws would serve as push and pull factors in individuals' migration attitudes given that they indicate structural access to civil rights as well as potential for exposure to discrimination. And we know that access to rights can serve as pull factors for migration. So prior research has found, for example, that individuals might weigh marijuana access in deciding where to move or where to go to college. And we've also seen that states with more LGBTQ friendly environments um, are more likely to serve as a draw for so-called gay movements. And more specifically, if we look at states that have had laws on the books that afford rights to LGBTQ individuals um, that were denied in other states, so things like marriage or the ability to adopt or foster or protection against employment discrimination, all these have been cited as motivators for migration. 
And we're seeing similar discussions surrounding the current surge in anti-LGBTQ laws um, seen across states. So news stories have been describing individuals who are planning moves due to restrictions on gender affirming care, um, particularly for children, or concerns of the effects of education-related laws like Florida's LSA gay law. And in these cases, people are citing laws in their own states as these push factors for moving and protection and destination states as cool factors. And so we're seeing these legal and political factors working similarly to what we've typically seen in violation to the desire to escape discrimination um, and to gain access to rights as you may gain in these moves. There's been less focus on how some of these laws might deter individuals from moving to a particular state. Although there have been some news reports um, about the surrounding variation in state abortion laws. So some stories have covered uh, potential de deterrent effects of restrictive abortion laws um, on decisions about where to attend college, where to start new careers. And there's also been more focused stories on how those in the medical field um, might um, decline to move to particular states that have laws restricting gender affirming care um, or abortion access. And so in our study, we focus on this idea of state laws serving as a deterrent for migration. We administered a survey to 1,061 individuals over a month in December of 2022 to January 2023. Um, we drew on a panel through Prolific, which was a nat nationally representative across the variables of sex, race, and age. Uh, this survey asked participants about how 11 different laws might shape their attitudes about migrating to a particular state. The sample was not limited to LGBTQ individuals, so we were interested in determining whether these laws might have an effect on willingness to migrate to a state, even for individuals who might not be directly affected by the law. And as we expected, political orientation was the strongest predictor of attitudes about moving to a state with any of these restrictive laws, um, with more liberal individuals expressing more aversion. But what was notable, if you can see any of these data there, is that if you look at the attraction line in the um, table of chi-square analyses, is that the majority of conservatives did not view these laws as, as cool factors for migration. So overall, regardless of political orientation, the majority of participants indicated either that the laws would make them less willing to move to a state or that they wouldn't affect their decision either way. And if you look at the specific laws um, related to LGBTQ individuals, the greatest amount of aversion was reported for laws that might place restrictions on same-sex marriage. So this just reflects the widespread um, support for marriage equality that has followed a broker bill. There was also a great deal of opposition to laws or policies surrounding child protective services investigating parents of transgender youth. And we actually saw similar aversion to moving to states with restrictions on traveling out of state to access abortion um, or providing incentives for reporting women or doctors for uh, seeking abortions, which overall indicated that individuals are pretty opposed to moving to states that have LGBTQ or abortion laws that are punitive in nature. Only small minorities of the sample reported that any of the 11 policies would serve as a pull factor, increasing their desire to move to a state. Um, sports restrictions in school based on gender identity and laws restricting gender affirming care for children had some of the greatest proportions of respondents across all political orientations, indicating they would be less averse to moving to a state with these policies. And restrictions on talking about gender and sexuality in schools predicted less aversion to moving for moderates and conservatives. And these policies all involve children, um, reinforcing the notion that gender uh, and sexual nonconformity is understood by some of you particularly threatening for minors. One other key finding here is that restrictions on transgender or non-binary adults um, and children were associated with relatively less aversion to migrate than policies on sexual education. So both public opinion polls um, and prior research indicate that there is greater opposition to transgender rights than to LGB rights. And this is particularly the case in gender segregated spaces like sports or like bathrooms. So while it's counterintuitive in many ways, that so few, given that so few people are going to be affected by some of these laws, this explains the less aversion to the United States with laws um, that restrict transgender and non-binary individuals particularly from high school sports. So then what we did is we created scales um, related to laws for transgender rights and LGB rights um, and ran regression analyses to examine predictors and migration attitudes in these two areas. And we found that women and gay men and lesbians reported more aversion to moving to states with restricted LGB laws, which is 
somewhat expected given that women tend to have more supportive opinions of LGBT individuals and LGB individuals would be more directly affected by these laws. But we also saw that those with LGBTQ household members were more averse to moving to states with restrictive laws, which supports what we're seeing in the news um, of, about families navigating these negative legal environments when they're making migration related decisions. We also saw some of the effects of socioeconomic factors um, with those who are earning at or above the median or those who are willing to move states for work or for education, more averse to moving to states with restrictive laws. And this suggests that states that are implementing these types of laws could experience negative economic impacts. Um, if higher earning workers, um, students are, are avoiding moving to or settling in these states post-graduation. On the other hand, we did see some characteristics that were associated with less aversion to moving to states with restrictive laws. And in particular, black individuals showed less aversion, which is unsurprising given that survey data suggests less support from the black community towards LGBT individuals, though we have seen this shift pretty dramatically following Obergefell. And we found those who have children in the household express less aversion to restrictions on um, same-sex marriage or laws related to um, the don't say gay type laws. And so again, this reflects this increased concern that participants tend to express regarding um, children and non-conforming sexuality or gender. But I did want to emphasize that on average, black participants and participants were, the children were still averse to the idea of moving to these, um, to states with these types of laws. We more directly assessed the way that legal and political factors shaped migration attitudes by looking at the status of LGBT rights um, in the state of origin. And we found that the laws in the state of origin did not predict attitudes toward migrating to states with more restrictive LGBT laws. But what we did find is those who said they would move states for political reasons, so that this would be a motivation for moving, and who are currently living in politically conservative areas are more reluctant to move to states with restrictive LGBT laws. And so this suggests that restrictive gender and sexuality policies, that they're serving more as a deterrent for politically motivated migration than as an incentive, meaning that states that are promoting these laws are unlikely to attract migrants. They're more likely to discourage new residents um, and potentially businesses from settling in their state. So overall, what we're seeing is the continued significance of political and legal context on the demographic outcomes of LGBTQ individuals. And if you look at this map from the Movement Advancement Project, it's showing policy tally scores for states. Um, it assesses things such as relationship and parental recognition, non-discrimination laws, religious exemptions, uh, laws related to LGBTQ youth, healthcare, criminal justice. So green areas have more positive legal environments and orange have more negative legal environments. Um, and what we're seeing is that while there have been these huge legal shifts, including the legalization of same-sex marriage in 2015 and the extension of Title VII employment protection um, in 2020, the variability across states and legal environments for LGBTQ individuals is an important factor when people are considering where to live. And these different legal contexts are important shapers of a variety of demographic outcomes, from timing of relationship formation um, to decisions and pathways with respect to parenthood, to employment opportunities um, and potential for discriminatory experiences, as well as physical and mental health outcomes. So what does this mean for demographers? Um, queer demographers are not be uniquely shaped um, by legal and political context, but given the legacy of prior discriminatory laws and the surge of new bills and laws in these areas, it continues to be particularly salient when we're studying LGBTQ populations especially given this variation that we see in political and legal environments in the U.S. Um, demographers should consider whether incorporating these types of contextual measures into their analyses is needed in order to understand outcomes, not just for LGBTQ individuals, but also for their families. We would also benefit from better me measures of contextual variation in legal environments at finer geographic levels, given that many politically conservative states have more liberal zones or enclaves that might provide improved outcomes for people. Given the surge in anti-LGBTQ bills and laws, there's also going to be a demand for new research on examining how legal and political context shapes both the frequency and the type of experiences of discrimination um, and other forms of victimization, such as hate crimes. And these changes will permit the identification of context-specific predictors of outcomes for LGBTQ individuals 
and the ability to tailor policy interventions in response. So as we're continuing as a discipline to generate knowledge in response to shifting rights access, a clear demography has the potential to provide additional insight into the ways that structural stigma and discrimination are fundamental shapers of demographic outcomes. Thank you very much. Well, should I give the response? This cover? <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, good to see everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity to um, share some thoughts. Uh, my name is Jim Ramo. I know many of you. I obviously don't know those who are visiting, with some exceptions. Um, uh, uh, I'd begin by um, sort of responding to what a couple of the speakers in this session said about uh, interloping or being interlopers uh, and not considering themselves demographers. I mean, I have to confess in the reverse. Um, I'm a demographer. I study low fertility and population aging in East Asia. And I know little or nothing about queer scholarship. So I've learned a lot, even though I've only been here uh, for an hour. I've been teaching all day. Um, uh, so I, I have uh, learned a lot in a short period of time and uh, hope that what uh, I might have to say uh, as somebody who uh, does a lot of work in the field of demography, but focusing on very different things, um, has to share will be of some use um, to you guys and stimulate um, some conversation. Um, I'm going to try to keep it simple, and I want to talk about data and theory. <laughs> so uh, primarily data, um, because I think that that was uh, raised a couple of times uh, in, in terms of um, some of the difficulties that people working in this space uh, are encountering. And of course, this is what demographers spend much of our time doing, thinking about measurement, implementing measurement, collecting data, uh, and of course, thinking about how uh, measurement issues uh, influence, uh, facilitate, or hinder our ability to make inferences about the things um, that we care about. So I, I'll spend a little bit of time on, on that front. Um, one thing that really struck me as, as being quite interesting, uh, and, and I, wasn't, I haven't been here all day, so maybe this is something you guys have been grappling with, um, from the start of the day, but I think it was the, the second um, speaker uh, said something to the effect, uh, are, are we talking about uh, introducing and increasing the emphasis on LGBTQ populations within a demographic framework, or are we thinking about borrowing the demographic principles, ideas, ways of thinking about things, measurement into queer scholarship? And uh, my take is, from the three uh, talks I listened to, it's definitely both. Um, I, I learned an awful lot from the first two because I know nothing about this. The third one was clearly what I would imagine to be queer demography, thinking about the ways in which policies in particular um, may influence uh, demographic outcomes that we are interested in as demographers, migration uh, in this case, or in the earlier study cited, thinking about the ways uh, in which specific policies or specific policy environments uh, may influence people differently depending on their uh, sexual orientation or gender identification. Um, so I think it's really an important um, issue to grapple with, to think that I mean, you've titled this queer demography. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and is there any way of thinking about that in a unified sense? Or is this something that will just be two trains running parallel but talking to each other? which of course is fine, but I think it's an important, um, uh, it, it seems like an important sort of tension um, and something that uh, you guys are obviously um, thinking about. Um, data, um, so th this is, I mean, to me, this is amazing, particularly as somebody who doesn't do work in this area. I think, uh, I don't know, you, Gary, you maybe have to help me with this. Some of the very first exposure to um, thinking about and measuring the prevalence and characteristics of uh, LGB, LGB populations, I think at the time, uh, was work that you did. Uh, and th this was kind of pathbreaking, I think. And I, I'm a family demographer, uh, so I, I, I sort of think about this as the struggles that people went through earlier to measure cohabiting couples. Um, I, I know somebody's <laughs> very familiar with this literature, but thinking about old things like fossil Q, which will mean nothing to you guys, but 
are, are sort of, um, uh, to many people in the room, I should say, but are ways of indirectly measuring uh, things that we want to uh, be able to measure more precisely. And I think it sounds like we've come a long way uh, in terms of the ability to actually uh, collect information, meaningful information that allows for uh, assessment of prevalence, assessment of characteristics, the ability to evaluate the way in which different groups uh, are influenced in different ways by different sets of policies. Um, so this is fantastic um, on, on that front. However, it seems very clear that uh, there's a lot to be done. Uh, I, I think that um, as I was listening to the, um, I can't remember which one it was, but I'm, I, the point that we made was that we need more data uh, on uh, LGBT populations. And, and I think uh, immediately, must be population represented, must be standardized. Uh, and then these things came up in other, if we wanna talk about and make comparisons over time, over space, uh, if we want to uh, be able to triangulate findings across studies, you have to have consistent standard measures. And um, this is difficult in many instances, but I was struck, uh, I was thinking as I'm listening, wow, this seems really hard. And I was particularly thinking about the 21 going to 42 um, uh, <laughs> options. That, that is not a good framework for thinking about how to measure things in a consistent, standardized way that would allow for the kinds of things, um, allow us to do the kinds of things that as demographers, we feel as our mission <laughs> um, uh, in, in terms of understanding prevalence and differentials and, and so on. And then another thing that really struck me in terms of the measurement issues, um, uh, I, I told you I was teaching um, uh, all day today, and this is actually something that came up uh, explicitly, is the difficulty of consistent standardized measurement across societies where the meaning is different. And I, I think, it, so we were talking about things like self health and things like that, where we can think about anchoring and um, using sort of uh, assessments of underlying evaluation scales and recalibrate to make things a little bit more comparable. <laughs> I don't know about that. In this case, this seems like something that was, is, is not amenable to these kinds of um, conventional statistical uh, approaches to calibration to account for differences across societies in what things mean. Um, uh, so I, I think it's, this is really challenging uh, as, I, as I listen um, uh, to, to some of the issues um, that were being raised. Um, let me see, I, 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 I only had the slides to go by. It's hard to take notes based on slides. So I, I have a lot of notes here, but I have the one problem is I can't read my own writing. Um, uh, hang on just a sec. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just, um, I'll, I'll just um, talk a little bit more um, about the, the, the theory. So this, the theory part. So this goes back to the point I was trying to make earlier uh, about what, what is this? Is this demography with a new area? Um, Perhaps, I mean, I think the third paper for sure. Um, as a demographer, I look completely <laughs> understand um, exactly what's going on and, and can see um, you know, precisely how this is just a, uh, a application of conventional methods to a group that we haven't studied uh, sufficiently and, and need to know more uh, about. Um, the other ones, I, 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 I wonder, because I think as a demographer, um, there, there was, um, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just noting that I think there are very different ways of thinking about data and thinking about the uh, ways we go about research and thinking about the purpose of the research we're doing. And, and one was, I, I think there was a mention of collecting data in support of ultimately abolishing policies. And of course, as a demographer, you know, whoa, we, we can't we can't think like that. I mean, that would uh, you know the demographers bristle at the thought of, of sort of um, uh, data collection motivated by activist um, uh, goals, um, which again is not to make a value judgment in any way or another, but to think about the ways in which 
the, the integration of different strands of research, different ways of thinking about things, different ways of measurement, different ways of thinking about the goals of our research ultimately. Are we interested in changing things? Are we interested in making things better? Or are we interested in understanding the world in a very descriptive way, which I kind of think is my job as a demographer, and I think most would probably agree. But I think um, the point I guess I want to make is this is fascinatingly important work that you guys are doing, um, obviously, in, the, in particularly in the US context, where these are you know, highly contentious political conversations. Um, one thing as demographers that we do bring to the table is clear representative data on which people can make evaluations. Um, the kind of data that people can't easily dismiss as, um, well, this was just a small sample that you collected somewhere. I can ignore this, but if we can bring representative, standardized, clearly measured data that allow us to say something about the prevalence, the characteristics, and particularly disadvantages um, relevant to policies that we might be interested in changing, um, these are the kind of things that I think demography is particularly well suited to um, bring to the table uh, in terms of the things that I think people are interested uh, in. Um, in, I'm, I'm speculating about what came before, but uh, in the earlier sessions. So I'm over time already. I hope these are useful thoughts in some way or another, uh, but I appreciate, again, the opportunity to listen and learn. Thank you. Um, hello again. Thank you for the wonderful talks that have closed out a truly wonderful day. Also, uh, sending my thanks again to everyone who's spoken, to everybody from OPR who made this happen, including Steve, Kristen, Shannon, Nancy, all the folks that were there, Christopher and Sonia, obviously, for their sponsorship. Um, I'll note that I feel particularly lucky to provide a few comments on the first and last panels, since I see many parallels, some of which Jim actually drew out. Um, Jim's comments on data and measurement and his responses uh, remind me of many of the conversations we had early in the day, and it feels very full circle. Uh, but nonetheless, I want to take up the mantle of also trying to tie things back together and center a lot of my comments on the combination of queerness and demography, which I think is something that we're going to continue doing over dinner. Ethna's talk helped us think about how data can play a role, in quotes from the slides, in both short-term inclusivity, but also the abolition of violent institutions. That helped us understand how categorization processes have spread and crucially adapted across the world. Amanda has shown how political factors shape how some people think about moving to states with hostile LGBT laws or not. The word that Ethna continued to use throughout her talk that I particularly resonated with was the word responsive. In thinking about my own Preston Hubelin and Guillaume textbook on demographic methods, I think about how much of demography is based on deterministic methods. For example, cohort component models help us project a population forward based on the rate and population periods from today's time, so time n. But it's hard to think about what the world of tomorrow is going to be. The demographic balancing equation of births, deaths, and migration is a helpful heuristic for understanding what we think about the population now, but we don't necessarily know from that equation alone which social processes are driving these exact rates of fertility, mortality, and net migration. This is where our speakers make a critical intervention in helping us unpack social processes, particularly as executed and upheld by institutions. For instance, Thar's talk helps us understand some of the mechanisms for why these constructs that we're interested in, such as gender identity, are so difficult to pin down. Thar shows how these concepts transform and take on a life of their own as they move through different times and spaces. This adds complexity in many ways to one of the questions I had in response to Dyke's earlier presentation. Is there a way to create a shared set of comparable measures across contexts? Per Thar's explanation about transnational circulation and feedback loops, we might imagine that measurement might become perpetually circuitous or <laughs> loopy as places take on and change definitions of constructs. Measuring constructs and further comparing constructs might become even more challenging for the reasons that have been mentioned. Amanda's presentation also helped me better, ex better explain processes that situate demographic rates, such as internal migration. Amanda's work is a reminder that these gaps, as often studied in disparities research in demography, come from somewhere. Institutions, laws, and policies can be, and are often, drivers of the same topics that demographers are interested in. 
as ethnic folk who state violence by institutions like ICE can impact the mortality and morbidity of trans migrant subpopulations. Anti-LGBT policies can impact the migration rates between certain states amongst other subpopulations. In sum, I wanna paraphrase the quote that Amanda began her talk with, Gary introduced today by thinking about how demography affects policy and Amanda closed by thinking about how policy impacts demography. And I'll add one more observation on this full circle day. This panel has helped us explicitly understand where a queer perspective can benefit demography. Understanding how power structures each of the components of our classic demographic balancing equation and how change and fluidity from a queer perspective make our often deterministic methods fall apart. I will be excited to carry on this conversation more during the Q&A and onward during dinner. So thank you all. So um, the question I had, and I, actually all three of you might have some thoughts on this, is that we've talked a lot about this, even in the comments there, this notion that we somehow need to standardize and we need to, um, and, and this issue of like laws affecting demography and demography affecting laws. It seems to me there's a lot of parallels with race and ethnicity in in the world. And I'm curious about any of your perspectives on that. Because so like in census world, one of the distinctions of the 2000 and the 2010 census was that it was the first time in history that the race and ethnicity question didn't change between censuses. And it changed again in 2020 again. So race and ethnicity has been measured differently virtually every survey that the government has done in the u.s and i have to assume that the context of race and ethnicity internationally is very different than the u.s context so i'm just curious whether you think there's any parallels and if so and and also like in our current world now with all the efforts to eliminate diversity and inclusion stuff is that going to have an effect on our ability do you think it might have any effect on our ability to collect quality data around race and ethnicity? And what does that mean for, for queer stuff as well? So that would be. Okay, we'll take a couple and then we'll hand it back to the, to the panel. So the other, anyone else have a question? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much for these really insightful talks. So um, I have a question that is, I guess, mostly inspired by Dara's uh, talk. So I really enjoyed that and appreciated that you brought those transnational perspective with this added dimension of postmillennial critique. So I'm wondering, thinking about this, and I guess all day today, we've kind of been talking about the discrepancies between what researchers are talking about and the realities of people's lives and how they think about themselves. So uh, I guess, uh, what coming out of your work, do you have any ideas about strategies to make uh, trans well, scholarship on trans issues or queer and trans issues um, serve the interests of trans and uh, gender non-conforming better, and also to not reproduce harm against geopolitical injustice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions, or we we'll come back to the panel? Oh, okay. Um, the question from online said, uh, "Queer people are often excluded from the benefits of social citizenship." to bring the policy portion of the discussion, uh, such as political power, autonomy, and social acceptance, how has this exclusion influenced different aspects of each of your Okay, I guess we'll start with you, and then we'll work, make our way back. You all saved the hardest for 5.30. Yeah, right. So on the last one, um, just to comment briefly on the last one to begin with, because I appreciate the question a lot in my work on immigration. Mm -hmm. Some of what I'm trying to do is talk about the connections between queer migrants and queer citizens, right? Who deal with lots of intersecting issues, but not the same group. So how do we capture the links, but not the same, but not conflate them, not use them as analogies, collapse them into the one? One of the ways that I found helpful is the concept of citizenship, um, dividing it into the track between legal and belonging, and around and those actually kind of co-construct one another. So if you have, um, if folks impugn your social belonging, to also challenge your political status, but they're still not the same thing. 
to get to the things. So I wanted to suggest about that, that to differentiate creates a space between so social belonging and perspectives is really helpful for creating opportunities to think of spaces where marginalized citizens use that category to discuss and migrants actually can work together in shared coalitions. And that that's actually a very difficult space to articulate without people collapsing all the categories. That was on question three, but I'm going to let others speak for a moment. Okay, so this question on um, the sort of like race and ethnicity and what are the parallels, I think the best example I can think about at the global level is the attempt to make sense of indigeneity and the sort of like conversations happening at the UN and other bodies that have been happening for like the past decade and a half or two decades um, on, on what indigenous peoples means. And I, I think that it, there's actually really similar kinds of um, challenges um, in sort of, because, because that, um, Term means something really specific here in the United States and actually means something different if you talk to different groups here. But then if you go somewhere else, it also means something really different. Um, and and so I'm not sure like what the lessons learned are, but I do think that there are similar kinds of challenges. When we're talking about race and ethnicity, though, um, one one thing I just want to say quickly is that, you know, in and many, many scholars, sociologists have written about this, race and ethnicity matter a lot in the US context and transnationally. But there are also other kinds of social structures that matter that sometimes get overlooked because we sort of use a sort of US centered frame or think about social structures. So things like religion or um, caste or you know other other kinds of sort of um, marked identities or, or sort of like marking, you know, mark markings, but also social structures that that might matter. Um, um, for ideas for how to not perpetuate the, the kinds of harms that, that we see. You know, one way of reading my project, I think, and I didn't, I didn't sort of get to articulate this whole thing, but one way to read it is to that it is like a, um, there is a sort of optimistic vision, maybe, because I think that there's feedback happening, and it's not that, that feedback is being suppressed, right? It's actually transforming the ways that people are understanding and defining gender variance. And so one way to think about it is, you know, there I'm showing mechanisms in, in different parts of the talk that actually show how a category transforms in response to, you know, suggestions that it is symbolically violent. Um, and, and as I show um, in the paper, you know, like it, the category itself becomes more ambiguous. And that is actually one way in which it becomes less violent. Like it's more sort of capacious. Of course, it introduces other kinds of problems with sort of the standardized meaning over time. And how do you, you know, move from one study to another? These are other important questions that, um, when we're constantly changing definitions and things, you know, it, it, it's not going to help with that that kind of problem. To start off with the question about race and ethnicity, I think what it reminds me of is um, the way that the census has constantly been trying to grapple with Hispanic ethnicity, right. and and so the, you know we're going to change the order of the question, and that's going to force people to respond the way we expect them to. <laughs> Ultimately, right? They've now conceded defeat, and that this is not effective, and we need to put this as a race-based category on the census because we're responding to the way that people actually identify their lives. And it seems like we, we, if there's a lesson to be learned, it's that we need to listen more to the way people's self-identity, how that's mapping onto identification processes. And so going back to this idea of um, you know, having these expansive categories and the challenges that it's presenting for demographers, I think that that's certainly the case, but um, without opening up these categories, at least allowing for you know, the other fill in the blank category, I think we don't see these emerging identity categories happening. And as Jamie pointed out, then we lose the ability not only to recognize the growth of the new category, but to see how it might be mapping on the demographic aspects. And so I think that that's, if anything, what it's going to take away from race. Okay, so, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're going to offer any skill to me. I guess I was just, you know, I appreciate the question, Gary. My brain has a hard time with the question of parallels ever. Because I am not starting with people who are like white citizens. Right. And for that reason, I can never start there and end anywhere helpful. <laughs> so, um, for right. my classes, I mean, mm -hmm. but the, I agree there are lots of lessons to be learned. So, I'm probably an issues focused. And from that, 
you know, who has the authority to set the terms for the categories? What are the relations of power we're looking at? And who actually should be at the center of the conversation and setting the term? Um, so that's why my brain could not really think about anything helpful to say, but I'm really interested in your other extremely difficult question about the politics of we may not have DEI anymore, we may not do, and it took a lot is focused on affect, white people's affect, let's be explicit, right? Like we may not talk about anything that might make people feel bad. And I'm just thinking, well, there's a lot of stuff talked about that makes LGBT folks feel bad all the time. And there's a lot of stuff talked about that makes migrants feel like crap, right? So what, like how do we start to analyze what's happening? And I do, I'm extremely interested in that question. So I appreciate what came up. Well, okay, well, thank you everyone. Uh, this is our final panel. Give a round of applause for everyone. <laughs>